Welcome to the premiere performance of From Stanton to Steinem and Beyond. While most of us are not experienced actresses, we decided this Reader's Theater would be a convenient way of sharing information we've gathered about the role of women in our culture. We're aware that the Equal Rights Amendment has been stalled and is in a kind of legal limbo, leaving women out of the United States Constitution and at the mercy of state legislatures as to our legal status and civil rights. The Equal Rights Amendment would have made sex a suspect classification in our Constitution, like race, so that discrimination against women would become harder to do. Many of us here hope to pass on equal rights to our daughters before we die. And we still believe, like Susan B. Anthony said, failure is impossible. So before we start, we would like to read you the full text of what might have been, and might still be, the 28th Amendment to our Federal Constitution. Don't panic, it's very short. Section 1. Equality of rights under the law shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex. Section 2. The Congress shall have the power to enforce by appropriate legislation the provisions of this article. Section 3. This amendment shall take effect two years after the date of ratification. What we hope to convey here is the feeling for what has led to the fight for women's rights in every sector of our society. How old a struggle it is. The social context which makes the struggle necessary. And finally, what women might have to offer as an alternative in an uncertain future. All of the material contained in our presentation was taken from reliable sources. A bibliography is provided in case you want to do further readings. We hope you will be both entertained and enlightened. I just don't understand why you get so riled up about things like the Hobby Lobby decision. You don't even work there. Barbie, most women today must work. And their health care is tied to where they work. If you need a type of health care that can be arbitrarily denied by the company you work for, you really don't have much in the way of health care at all. The U.S. Supreme Court's ruling lately in the Hobby Lobby case and in Planned Parenthood versus Casey are doing away with women's control of their reproductive and thus their economic lives. It makes them very vulnerable to the elites who are in control. Why would I want to risk my privileges as a woman and my lifestyle because you want to move forward as a woman? It is, it, I like it when a man opens a door for me. If you really understood what it means to be a woman and the protections we have... Lifestyles, privileges, protections, those privileges and protections you speak of continue to be shackles for many. I'm not sure you really understand. Gloria, God has decreed women are the helpmate of man. It says right in the Bible that the head of every woman is a man. Barbie, the Bible also says that in the Lord, woman is not independent of man, nor man of woman. For as a woman was made from man, so man is born of woman. The Bible wasn't speaking of economics. The history of mankind, and I do mean mankind, is a history of repeated injuries and tyrannies of men over women. Hold it. Um, you both will be given a chance to speak, uh, but we have to establish some order here. Um, 
Barbie, what is your point? I am so far past all this feminism stuff. I have a good job and I have no problem getting a date. I want Gloria to quit badgering me with the idea that women are oppressed by men. She just needs to tone it down. Thank you, Barbie. Gloria, I presume you have a different point of view. Barbie in loving families means maybe women can be cosseted and cared for. But in this country and in this world, it isn't often the case. Just listen to what our benevolent protectors have written about us. The reason for early marriage is obvious when one recalls that woman, who is bad by nature, has to be placed as soon as possible under the beneficial protection of a man. What is woman but an enemy of friendship, an unavoidable punishment, a necessary evil, a constantly flowing source of tears? Since she was formed of a crooked rib, her entire spiritual nature has been inclined more towards sin than virtue. Women either love or hate. There is no third possibility. If she does not love God, she must resort to the opposite extreme and hate him. It is thus clear why women are addicted to the practice of sorcery. Remember when Elvis sang the words, Listen to me, baby, try to understand. I'd rather see you dead, little girl, than with another man. Todd Aiken, who was running for the Senate against Claire McCaskill in Missouri, was asked in an interview whether he believed abortion is justified in cases of rape and replied that rape does not result in pregnancy. He said, it seems to be, first of all, from what I understand from doctors, it's really rare. If it's a legitimate rape, the female body has ways to try to shut the whole thing down. Twitter soon erupted with outrage and links to the interview. He didn't win the Senate race, thank goodness. More recently, Tom Corbin, a South Carolina state senator, told his colleague, Senator Katrina Sheely, the only woman in the body, well, you know, God created man first. Then he took the rib out of man to make woman. And you know, a rib is a lesser cut of meat. A staffer noted that he made comments like that all the time. Older women are labeled cougars for doing what men have done for centuries. Rap musicians use ho, bitch, and baby mama as if we were destined to only sex and reproduction in life. And the blonde jokes, I am disgusted with the way language is used against us. When I hear a sentence like, mankind is polluting the oceans, I say, that's exactly where the blame should lie. In the 60s, students used to make speeches about freedom for the masses but women were still expected to serve the coffee. Barbie will think I'm being picky, but language and appearance do influence attitudes. Speaking of the 60s, do you remember when Stokely Carmichael said, women in the civil rights movement can be of most use in the prone position? Stokely Carmichael, who on the earth is he? I wasn't even born in the 60s. What's wrong with wanting to look good for men? I just loved watching Sex in the City on TV. Those girls weren't worried about their rights, and they weren't worried at all about how sexy their clothes made them look. Speaking of clothes, ask yourself how and why fashions were established. There's a lot of interesting literature in that area. In 19th century England and America, the two sexes wore clothing which widely exaggerated their anatomical differences and clearly defined society's expectations of them. Men were serious. They wore dark colors and little ornamentation. Women in families of means were ornamental and frivolous. They wore light pastel colors, ribbons, laces, and bows. Men were active. They wore clothes that allowed movement. Women were inactive. Their clothes inhibited movement. The clothes clearly reflected the idea of the exquisite slave, submissive, 
frail, patient while in pain. A woman's highest duty was to suffer and be silent. They were so tightly laced in, and for so long... Well, you have to keep looking good if you want to keep men interested. I like it when men take notice when I enter a room. That their spines atrophied, and they regularly fainted and died early. Speaking of women's health, why has it taken so long to develop successful treatments for breast cancer? Why are women with breast cancer cosseted with pink teddy bears and often discouraged from speaking honestly about how they feel about the disease? Do men with prostate cancer get stuffed animals? Are they encouraged to be happy about their disease? Why weren't women included in the earliest populations for studying heart disease? We now know that symptoms of heart attack for women are quite different than for men. See what I mean about her going on and on? Suffer and be silent. What choice did she have? Try playing a set of tennis in a steel reinforced corset, which makes your waist 14 inches round. You can lay the choice of lethal clothing on you can't lay the choice of lethal clothing on men. If women wore such things, that's their problem. Honestly, you people. Well, the I am concerned that you don't understand that it all goes together. The sufferer and be silent routine. The dismissal of woman as evil. Every 19th century man knew for certain that an unbound woman was a really dangerous phenomenon. Western fashion still encourages women to dress provocatively, even though we think the decisions about clothes are our own. And we pay a price for this. Haven't you ever heard a man say about the way a woman is dressed, she's asking for it? We see this today in the cultures of the Middle East. Although the Quran doesn't require it, the Islamic culture implies women uncovered are too great a temptation for men. Women are regularly killed for immodesty and dishonoring the men in their families even when they are not at fault. I am sorry about that, but I don't see that I can do much about it. I bought some Manola Blanics recently. They cost me a week's salary and they are a little hard to walk in, but the whole effect the is... The point is that no Victorian woman could be fashionable and still have the strength to be any sort of threat. Their sleeves were so tight they couldn't raise their arms above their waists. Hardly a combat uniform. Just take the shoes of today, Barbie, like the ones you bought. Could you run in them if you were in trouble and needed to? This whole idea carried to an extreme, was found in Chinese foot binding. Chinese foot binding started many centuries ago after a group of women attempted to overthrow the government. As punishment of the sex that produced these militants, the feet of all infant girls were bound and broken so they could not walk without pain, which, it was presumed, would keep their minds off insurrection. Having a wife with child-sized feet became a fetish and status symbol for Chinese men. It meant they were wealthy enough to have women in their households that did not have to do physical work. Or, if they were poor and their daughters were pretty, it maybe it meant finding a richer husband. Imagine doing farm work on broken feet. Imagine breaking your daughter's feet so she could find a better husband. You do go on, don't you? Those are not really a critical issue, are they? In more serious things, women have held their own. Take Clara Barton. Take Florence Nightingale. Take, take Sibylla Masters. Take Mrs. Jacquard. Who? Take Mrs. Who? Take who? Did you hear who? In 1715, Sibylla Masters of Philadelphia invented a new way of cleaning and curing corn. But under English common law, the patent was granted to her husband, Thomas. In 1716, Sibylla Masters invented a new way to prepare straw for covering hats and bonnets. Thomas Masters secured that patent also. When you hear someone say a woman hasn't invented anything, I ask, who invented the jacquard loom? Mrs. Jacquard! 
Who invented the cotton gin? Oh, I know that one. It was Mrs. Mrs. General, General Green. Green. But Mrs. General Green invented the cotton gin and showed her idea to Eli Whitney, and he claimed it for his own patent. Who invented the sewing machine? The, the, the wife, wife of Eli Howe. According to a Civil War acquaintance of Mr. Howe, the story is this. After Mr. Howe worked for 14 years to put together a sewing machine without success, his wife invented it. And the reaper? That was Mr. Mac. A right, a West Virginia woman who, after Mr. McCormick and his father failed, rigged an ingenious system of scissors nailed to a board and came up with the principle of the first mowing machine. Barbie, the reason no one knows all of this is that women could not take credit for their work, either socially or legally. That's all well and good, but you don't see women today inventing things and not getting any credit. Not getting any credit happens a lot. Here's a letter to the editor of Discover Magazine <clears throat> sent in by a woman reader which appeared in the September 2014 issue after the July-August issue printed a list of science heroes sent in by readers. The Gallery of Heroes section included many marvelous scientists, including many heroes of mine. But I couldn't help but notice that every scientist mentioned by name was a man. Did no one write in with a female hero or idol? Here's mine, Jane Goodall. Her work with chimpanzees revolutionized our understanding of what it means to be a human. The editors replied, We actually noticed this and commented on it ourselves, but the heroes shown on the inbox page are, in fact, reflective of the emails we received. Not a single reader until you wrote in about a female scientist there are certainly many heroic scientists out there, though, including Jane Goodall. What do Scotchgard, windshield wipers, bullet-resistant Kevlar fabric, and glow-in-the-dark paper have in common? They were all invented by females, and none of this is commonly known. In fact, Becky Schroeder's patent for the glow sheet prompted NASA to ask if she was an ex-employee because this space agency was working on a similar project. She wasn't. She was just 12 years old. Have you ever heard of Hedy Lamarr, the beautiful movie star in the 30s and 40s? She was smart as well as beautiful. In 1942, the U.S. Patent Office issued her patent number 2292387 for her invention of a secret communication system. This was a frequency hopping radio device which she and her friend George Ann Thiel, an avant-garde composer, invented so the U.S. Navy torpedoes could thwart interception by enemy ships. Although this was not used in World War II, largely because the inventor was a woman, if you have Bluetooth, a cordless phone, Wi-Fi, or a GPS, or you scan something through a barcode reader, you have used Hedy Lamarr's technology. My name is Rosalind Franklin. I was responsible for much of the research and discovery work that led to the understanding of the structure of DNA. I was probably one of the world's foremost experts at X-ray diffraction techniques. I worked in John Randall's laboratory at King's College, London. He gave me full responsibility for one of the DNA projects in the lab. Maurice Wilkins also headed one of the projects, but he never accepted me as an equal researcher despite my doctorate in physical chemistry from Cambridge in 1945. Without my permission, Wilkins showed one of my x-rays to James Watson, who was also studying DNA, but did not understand its structure. My x-ray of the double helix showed Watson how the molecules were constructed. Because of this, James Watson, Francis Crick, 
and Maurice Wilkins received a Nobel Prize for the double helix model of DNA in 1962, four years after I had died from ovarian cancer. The Nobel Prize is not given to more than three people for the same award, nor is it given to dead scientists. But I wonder if I would have been included had I still been alive. Dr. Franklin has received some recognition in this country. In 2004, Finch University of Health Sciences, the Chicago Medical School, changed its name to the Rosalind Franklin University of Medicine and Science to honor Franklin's role in science and medicine. The Nobel Prize isn't often given to life scientists either if they are women. My name is Wu Jianxiong. I was born in 1912. My father, he advocated educating girls and eventually I studied physics at the University of California in Berkeley. In 1956, I devised an experiment with revolutionary results. My colleague proposed a theory that would disprove a widely accepted law of physics called the parity law, which stated that objects, they are mirror images of each other behave in the same way. I conducted an experiment where I spun radioactive cobalt-60 nuclei at a low temperatures. If the law held, the electron would shoot off in pair directions. The result of my experiments demonstrated that they did not. My work was termed the most important development in the field of atomic and nuclear physics to date. But only my male co-workers received the Nobel Prize for disproving the parity law. The prize committee overlooked me completely. It seems women have to fight for everything. 200 years ago, the laws were really stacked against women. And it seems they still are. Generally, a woman had no legal claim on her children because the father had the right to choose their guardian in his will. When a woman married, husband and wife became one legal unit, the husband. A woman lost control of the land management of her real property to her husband, who didn't have to account to her for anything. What a collection of antiquities, 19th century women, old, outdated laws. As recently as 1977, in the state of Alabama, a wife was required to get her husband's permission to sell her own separate real estate. In Massachusetts in the late 70s, property was jointly owned by both spouses, but only the husband had the right to manage and control it and to receive any profits from it. Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg has suggested that her male colleagues sometimes do not hear a woman's voice, including her own. In a 2009 magazine interview with USA Today, she said that the other justices, who were then all men, sometimes ignored the arguments she made at their private conferences. Justice Ginsburg said, I'll say something, and I don't think I'm a confused speaker, and it isn't until somebody else in, says it that everyone will focus on the point. In cases involving gender, she said, the court has never fully embraced the ability of women to decide for themselves what their destiny will be. She said the court's five justice conservative majority, all men, did not understand the challenges women face in achieving authentic equality. More than 45 years after the Equal Pay Act was passed in 1963, women are being paid less for performing the same job as their male colleagues. According to the Institute of Women's Policy Research, in 2012, women working full-time earned just 77 cents for every dollar earned by a man, costing women and their families anywhere from 400000 to $2 million in wages over a lifetime. This pay gap 
is a family economic issue since 47% of women are their family's sole source of income. When you make millions of dollars at a time, maybe it doesn't matter. But the recent Sony Pictures hacking incident has shown us that even female movie stars are paid less than their male counterparts. Every year, usually sometime in April, we recognize Equal Pay Day. That is the date in the current year when women finally make as much money as most men made in the previous calendar year. In other words, it takes women on average 16 months to make what most men make in a year. Well, we can thank Lily Ledbetter, Alice Paul, the suffragettes, and many others for getting us this far. Just listen to what Ernestine Rose has to say about her efforts to have the Married Women's Property Bill passed in the New York State Legislature. I sent the first petition in to the New York State Legislature to give the married woman the right to hold real estate in her own names in the winter of 1836-37. After much effort, I obtained five signatures. Some of the ladies said the gentlemen would laugh at them. Others said they had rights enough. The men said that the women had too many rights already. I continued sending petitions with increasing numbers of signatures for 11 years until 1849. In 1849, the legislature granted women the right to keep what was their own. No sooner did it become legal than all the women said, oh, that is so right, and we ought to have had that all along. I am Lily Ledbetter. I was a supervisor at the Goodyear Tire and Rubber Company in Gadsden, Alabama from 1979 until I retired in 1998. For most of those years, I worked as an area manager, a position largely occupied by men. Initially, my salary was in line with the salaries of men performing substantially similar work. Over time, however, my pay slipped in comparison to the pay of male area managers with equal or less seniority. By the end of 1997, I was the only woman working as an area manager. And the pay discrepancy between my pay and that of my 15 male counterparts was stark. I made $3,727 per month. The lowest paid male area manager received $4,286 per month. The highest paid received $5,236 per month. After someone secretly let me in on how little I was making for doing the same job as men, I sued the company. My lawsuit eventually reached the Supreme Court, which denied my claim because I did not file the suit within 180 days from my first paycheck, even though at the time I didn't even know that I was earning less. Ruth Bader Ginsburg wrote a strong dissent. After that, the 111th United States Congress passed the Lilly Ledbetter Fair Pay Act in 2009 to loosen the time limitation requirements for the filing of a discrimination suit. So long as any act of discrimination, including the receipt of a paycheck that reflects a past act of discrimination, occurs within the 180-day period of limitations. But the pay disparity further led to inquiry and inequity in my overtime pay, contributory retirement, 401k and Social Security, which can never be made up. This time, the law was made fairer for women but we need an Equal Rights Amendment to our Constitution 
because every right a woman has now can be taken away by a legislature except the right to vote, which is in the United States Constitution. My name is Jackie Cochran, and I want you to give special acknowledgement to the Women's Air Force Service pilots. As challenging as it seems, our government almost forgot to give them credit for their service. Nancy Love and I started organizing women's flying units and training detachments in 1943. These units became known as the WASP. The WASP flew every type of plane in the Army's arsenal. We served as flight instructors, tow target pilots for gunnery training, engineering flight test pilots, and flew radio controlled planes. Even though we flew into war zones, we were still seen as civilians. Of the 1,830 volunteers and 1,074 graduates, only 38 lives were lost. The program ended in 1944 after we women flew more than 60 million miles. 33 years later, in 1977, we were finally recognized as military personnel with benefits. Unfortunately, this was way too late for many of us. Some people in the legislature still say we shouldn't have an Equal Rights Amendment because women would have to fight in wars. Tell that to a female soldier who fired a 50 caliber machine gun in Iraq or Afghanistan. Well, I appreciate hearing about your service, but it is getting late, and I have a date tonight. In 1912, Margaret Sanger, a nurse, Accompanied a doctor on an emergency call. Sadie, a poverty-stricken mother of three, had become desperate when she learned yet another baby was on the way. Another child will finish me, doctor. Any more tricks like this, and there'll be no need to send for me. But how can I prevent it? Oh, you want your cake and eat it too. Well, it can't be done. The only sure way is to tell Jake to sleep on the roof. He doesn't understand, does he? He is a man after all. But you do, don't you, Margaret? You're a woman, and you will tell me the secret, and I'll never tell a soul. But though I was a nurse, I did not know how to prevent conception. Three months later, I received another call. Sadie, pregnant again, was near death. The primitive homemade abortion she had performed on herself had resulted in blood poisoning, and now she was dying. By the time I reached her, she was dead. Because I worked on the Lower East Side of New York City, mostly with poor immigrant women, I saw this happen all too often. The next morning, I began what was to become my life's work, helping women to regulate their families so that each child would be a wanted child. I first used the phrase birth control and founded the first contraceptive clinic in the United States. And the following year, I was sent to the workhouse for creating a public nuisance. I was arrested and prosecuted too many times to count. I was told I was breaking the Comstock Act of 1873, which defined information about contraceptives as obscenity. And finally, laws began to change and give doctors the right to give birth control advice and later birth control devices to their patients and I helped organize the first World Population Convention in Geneva in 1924. Eventually, in 1942, with my help, the Planned Parenthood Federation came into being. Wait a minute, I've been doing some reading too. In the February 17, 1979 issue of Newsweek, Margaret Thatcher, who was leader of Britain's Conservative Party, said she owed nothing to the women's movement. Actually, here we go again. Actually, in British common law, 
she would have had neither legal personality nor the right to vote. Under such circumstance, it is doubtful if she could have held public office, emerged as a party leader, or become a barrister before that. Ellen Goodman, a national columnist, said, We need a dues collector from the women's movement. It's time we collect from everyone who's been helped by the courageous efforts of those who came before us. At the 2015 Oscars, Patricia Arquette spoke for many of us when she said, To every woman who gave birth to every taxpayer and citizen of this nation, we have fought for everybody's equal rights. It's our time to have wage equality once and for all and equal rights for women. Why belabor the point? Women were given the right to vote. We're given? We're given? Why didn't we have the right to vote to begin with, since we are so cherished in society? Failing that, to whom did we have to look for this gift? Man, very few gifts have been given so grudgingly. Abigail Adams, in a letter to her friend, wrote this. He, John Adams, is very saucy to me in return for a list of female grievances which I transmitted to him. I thought it was very probable our wise statesman would erect a new government and form a new code of laws. I ventured to speak a word in our behalf of our sex who are badly used by the laws of England, which give such unlimited power to the husband to use his wife ill. I believe I even threatened fomenting a rebellion in case we were not considered and assured him we would not hold ourselves bound by any laws in which we had neither voice nor representation. In return, he tells me he cannot but laugh at my extraordinary code of laws. My letter was his first intimation that women who were a tribe more numerous than the rest, that is, children, apprentices, Indians, and slaves were grown discontented. My name is Alice Paul. For us suffragettes, things came to a head in 1917. During that year, 218 women were arrested and 97 jailed for picketing the White House. Picketing a wartime president was considered unpatriotic. They decided to make an example of us. We were arrested for obstructing traffic and disturbing the peace. After my third arrest, I was sentenced to seven months in a workhouse in New Jersey. We were held in solitary confinement and beaten. The gruel we were fed was filled with worms and our source of water was from a pail. We were deprived of counsel. I went on a hunger strike and was force fed three times a day for three weeks. They could not risk having a martyr on their hands. The newspaper called us iron-jawed angels. The President of the United States, Woodrow Wilson, was among the men who tried to persuade a psychiatrist to declare me insane so that I could be permanently institutionalized. The doctor refused. He said I was strong and brave, but that didn't make me crazy. He said courage in women is often mistaken for insanity. We won the right to vote August 18, 1920. I wrote the first Equal Rights Amendment, and in 1923, it was introduced into Congress. It was reintroduced year after year for 49 years until Congress finally voted to send it to the states in 1972, with a ratification date of 1979. In 1978, Congress acted to extend the ratification time limit until June 20th, 1982. It is the only amendment to the Constitution ever sent to the states with a time limit. Although the time for ratification has passed, there still may be hope. The possibility exists that if it were ratified by only three more states, and we won a legal battle over constitutional interpretation, the Equal Rights Amendment could still become part of the Constitution. Arkansas could be one of those states. And then the fight would move to the Supreme Court. There is more, of course, 
What would government be like if women ran the country? We can look at Iceland as an example. Iceland's three main banks collapsed in October 2008, leaving debts more than 10 times the country's GDP. They were way beyond bankrupt and everyone blamed the men. So women stepped in to clean up the mess. The country's first female prime minister was elected. Women were in the majority in her cabinet, five to four. The banks were renamed, nationalized, and women were installed as their new CEOs. But they didn't have to be iron maidens of the Margaret Thatcher role model. The difference is that women thought of the next 10 to 20 years with sustainable development. Women established that in Iceland, the arts brought in as much money for the country as their main industry of aluminum mining did. So they talked about developing creative industries as well as traditional ones. When you have more women in government, there is a difference in what is discussed, a difference in emphasis. And what is good for women citizens is good for the men as well. The scene is the Ohio Women's Conference in 1851. A slave who calls herself Sojourner Truth has attended uninvited. Francis Gage is the chair of that convention. Again and again, timorous and trembling ones came to me and said with earnestness, Don't let her speak, Mrs. Gage. It will ruin us. Every newspaper in the land will have our cause mixed up with the abolitionists and niggers, and we shall be utterly denounced. My only answer was, We shall see when the time comes. There were very few women at the time who dared to speak in meeting, and the ministers who opposed equal rights were seemingly getting the better of us, while the boys in the galleries and the sneers amongst the pews were hugely enjoying the discomfort, as they su supposed, of the strong-minded. And our tender-skinned friends were on the point of losing dignity. The atmosphere suggested a storm. Oh, to it, dark Will the members of this convention give this speaker your attention? Ladies and gentlemen, Sojourner Truth. Well, children, where there's so much racket, there must be something out of kilter. I think that between the niggers of the South and the women of the North, all talking about rights, the white men will be in a fix pretty soon. But what's all this talking about? That man over there says that women need to be helped into carriages and lifted over ditches and to have the best places everywhere. Nobody ever helps me into carriages or over mud puddles or give me the best places. Ain't I a woman? Look at me. Look at my arm. I have plowed, planted, gathered into the barns, and no man can heed me. Ain't I a woman? I would work as much and eat as much as a man when I could get it and bear the lashes well. Ain't I a woman? I have borne 13 children and seen them, most of them sold into slavery. 
And when I cried out with my mother's grief, none but Jesus heard me. And I got a woman, if my cup won't hold but a pint, and yours holds a quart, wouldn't you be mean not to let me have my little half measure? Then that little man in black, a minister, he says, women can have as much rights as men, because Christ wasn't a woman. Where did Christ come from? From God and a woman. And man had nothing to do with it. If the first woman God ever made was strong enough to turn the world upside down alone, these women together ought to be able to turn it back again. And now they're asking to do it. The men better let them. Oblige to you for hearing me. And now old sojourner has nothing more to say. Mm -hmm.